So in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the functional form of yield criteria. And then we'll get into the discussion of what's called the pie plane in uh, high Westergaard stress space. So we'll cover these two topics. These are going to set us up for further discussions in J2 plasticity, which will be the focus of this particular course. And um, it, it'll also get us ready to talk about the normality flow rule based on the shape of the, the yield function or the yield criterion. So I'm going to write a few notes here and uh, I'll pause the video, write a few notes, and then I'll read them back. All right, so I'm trying out the typing here. We need a way to determine if plastic flow will occur for general states of stress. Formula that can take the components of the stress tensor or the principal stresses or invariants of the stress tensor are called yield criteria. We will initially consider isotropic materials. So we're going to start taking a look at our stress tensor sigma and I've written them out in a matrix form with the different components the normal stresses along the diagonal and shearing terms on the off diagonal and we can write down our characteristic equation In case we wanted to find the eigenvalues. So I'm going to write this as uh, in this form and I should note that some books write this in a slightly different form by alternating the signs but I will use kind of the modern notation here where sigma sub p represents a principal stress and in general there may be three different uh, uh, three values of principal stress that are non-zero. We're guaranteed to have real principal stresses because we have a positive definite symmetric tensor. Uh, however, the roots for sigma p may be uh, repeated, so they may not be unique. So we can have two values of the same principal stress. But I'll write it down in this form. Uh, minus sigma p cubed plus i1 sigma p squared plus i2 sigma p1 plus i2 sigma p plus i3 is equal to zero. Some people take these terms to the other side. Some people alternate these signs. If you look at Hill's book, uh, he will use the symbol J, uh, which is more commonly in the modern literature used as the invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor. So I'll use I, and uh, just be careful when you read other texts and refer to other literature how they define these uh, invariants of the, of the stress tensor. Now, we can express these invariants I1, I2, and I3 in different ways. I1 is the trace of the stress tensor and in terms of principal stresses we can write I1 as sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3. The second invariant I'll write it this way. It's a product among the pairs of principal stresses. So minus this quantity sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 2, sigma 3 and sigma 3 sigma 1. Another way to say this is that it's the determinant, the, the sum of the determinants of the cofactor matrices. Of course if you're in the principal directions then it, it reduces down to kind of a, a straightforward form. And I3 is the determinant and if we have diagonalized our stress tensor Due to finding the principal stresses, then it's just sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. So let's make a note here that these are principal stresses. Now, if you're watching this video, you probably uh, understand how to find principal stresses, but if not, um, I'm sure uh, either I have or will have at some point another video on how to find uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors for, uh, for the stress tensor, which are the, the principal stresses in their directions. Now since uh, we mentioned that we can express our yield criteria either in terms of components of the stress tensor or in principal stresses, 
or likewise we can do it in terms of the invariance of the stress tensor. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a generic function f that I'm going to call my yield criterion and I'm going to express this in terms of the invariance of the stress tensor. Uh, I1, I2, and I3. Now later on I'll use a different function and I'll still call it f so you have to kind of look at context for it. I don't necessarily mean the exact same function. I'm meaning this f is a generic function. It is a function of whatever it is, the invariance of the stress tensor or the dv torque stress tensor or so forth, but that represents some yield criterion. And as I mentioned before, we're going to restrict ourselves to isotropic materials. So this function of these three stress invariants is the most general form for isotropic materials. And just as a reminder, an isotropic material is one that behaves the same in all different directions. There are no preferred directions of yielding, no preferred directions of plastic flow, and if we were to do a stress-strain curve test, picking out any particular direction that we would want, we would get identical results in, in any direction that we would test that material in. Now, one thing to keep in mind and about all of this is if you look at a single crystal of material, it is not isotropic. It has preferred directions of flow and everything. The idea here being that if we have an aggregate of randomly oriented polycrystalline materials, that that random aggregate, if we look at a continuum scale, would behave relatively isotropically. There are some variations uh, and there are things that we can control, things we cannot control. Some materials start out anisotropic, some materials can be reasonably approximated as isotropic, but for our part right now we're just going to go with this isotropic assumption. Later on in the course we'll take a look at yield criteria for anisotropic materials. Okay. So this reasoning follows uh, Hill's book and it's also uh, you can find a discussion in Mendelssohn plasticity book. So since the material is isotropic, only terms involving the magnitudes of the principal stresses need to be considered in that function f. And these terms are most readily described in terms of the invariance I1, I2, and I3. An additional restriction since it is isotropic is that the yield criterion must be symmetrical in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Since there is no preferential direction, we can interchange uh, pulling on it in the x direction with pulling on it in the y direction or the first principle and second principle stress and so forth. And then this last one is, is a fairly convenient observation and it will, will help us in our quest for our plasticity theory based on J2. It's that an experimental observation is that yielding of metals is independent of hydrostatic pressure. Now is this strictly true? Well just like some of our other assumptions about isotropy no. Um, there is some variation of yield stress with hydrostatic pressure. It depends on the material. Most metals it's fairly independent. If you have porous materials uh, it may be significantly dependent on hydrostatic pressure. There are different yield criteria that we can talk about for hydrostatic pressure sensitive materials. Uh, Drucker Prager uh, plasticity uh, for clay and porous materials was one example. That's available in the finite element code abacus as well as some others. But for now we're going to stick with this assumption and we'll see where, where this leads us. The resulting J2 flow theory is uh, it's fairly elegant. Um, so we'll stick with this observation that, it, that yielding of metals is independent of hydrostatic pressure. Now the references for that can be found uh, from Bridgman. Uh, if you look through some of his 
papers from the 1940s, you will see that there's a discussion of hydrostatic stress uh, independence, of failure of all kinds of different materials. He looked at lots of different materials. Well, if we want to get rid of the hydrostatic term from the stress tensor, we have what is called the deviatoric stress. And the deviatoric stress, I'll define it as S. Here's the tensor form, Sij, those are the components. If we take our stress tensor and we subtract off the hydrostatic stress, and I'll define that in a moment, in our index notation, we can have one-third sigma kk, Kronecker delta ij. This term right here is also known as P, and that is the hydrostatic stress. So the hydrostatic stress is one-third of the trace of the stress tensor, which can be expressed either in terms of coordinate stress components or principal stress components. Now let's take a look at this hydrostatic term for just a, a little bit. This Kronecker delta ij that effectively works like the identity tensor. So the hydrostatic term in tensor form would be a diagonal matrix with zeros everywhere and the hydrostatic pressure along the diagonal. If we look at just this term, this term is often known as a spherical stress state. Because every direction is an eigenvector direction. And all of our eigenvalues are the same. They're all p. If we were to plot a Mohr circle for the hydrostatic stress, then it would plot as a single point for our 3D Mohr circle. Now you see the term hydrostatic. Well, the static is fairly easy to comprehend. It's a, it's a static stress state. And the hydro, well, that would be the type of stress state that we would get in an ideal fluid. Typically, in a hydrostatic stress state in a fluid, you would have a compressive hydrostatic stress. In a material, you could have tension or compression for that hydrostatic term. Well, the deviatoric stress, then, is the regular stress taking away this hydrostatic term, or this, this average normal stress, along the diagonal of each of our terms. And so I've talked about the hydrostatic stress and the deviatoric stress tensor in, in uh, some other lectures. But let's go ahead and write down what it would be if we had a stress tensor would be sigma x minus p, tau xy, tau xz along the top, sigma y minus p, tau yz, sigma z minus p, and this would be a symmetric tensor. Those would be the components. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that if we were to look at the trace of the deviatoric stress tensor, let's call it sigma, uh, let's call it SMM, that's where I and J would be equal, and the trace is when we add these together, so this would be S11 plus S22 plus S33, this would be equal to the trace of the stress tensor minus one third sigma KK, Kronecker delta MM. Now, Kronecker delta MM is equal to 3. 3 over 3 is 1. 
the interesting thing is that the trace of the deviatoric stress tensor is equal to zero. So by subtracting out the dependence of the hydrostatic stress on the yield behavior, what we can effectively do is we can recast our yield criterion in terms of only two invariants of the deviatoric stress tensor, and that would be of J2 and J3. Now specifically we can define these as uh, one half SIJ SIJ. Again J3 is the determinant of the tensor, in this case S, uh, which we can write in our index notation this way, one third SIJ SJK SKI with a, a triple sum on those. So there's different ways to write these determinants, or to, to, to write these uh, invariants, and this is just another way uh, to write them for the deviatoric tensor. We're going to make an additional restriction to our isotropic material behavior, and that is that it would behave the same in tension and compression. Now if you notice, J2 has squared terms of the stress, deviatoric stress tensor components. J3 has an odd function. So this would be like S11, S22, S33. It has three stresses multiplied by another. So it's a cubic type function. Because it's a cubic type function, you may get a different response if you have uh, one of them negative or all of them positive or different combinations of positive and negative. So we're also going to restrict the behavior of this yield function in terms of these two invariants that it has to be an even function of J3. An even function of J3 will allow us to maintain uh, independence of the sign of the stress. So again, just to state that, <clears throat> if we looked at a stress-strain curve in tension, where we have increasing stress and increasing strain, versus a stress-strain curve in compression, where we have negative stresses and negative strains, if this behavior is exactly symmetrical, then we're going to have to have uh, this yield criterion be an even function of J3. And again, not all materials are like this. And you can come up with your own yield criterion that involves non-symmetric behavior and so forth. Um, we're going to start with this. This is the classical theory. And once we understand the classical theory, then it's easier to go back and add things to it that, that, uh, that tweak it, that allow it to do the things that we want our yield criterion to do. All right, so now let's, now let's talk about the pi plane. And the pi plane is, is useful from a classical perspective in describing some limits on the yield criterion as far as uh, the shape of it and its independence or even dependence on hydrostatic stress. And the pi plane resides in something called the principal stress space with a high Westergaard space. So here we have stress coordinate axes, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. It's easy to visualize this because it is a, a three coordinate system type setup, a three axis setup. And if we can imagine that there is a line at which all the stresses are equal to one another, 
all the principal stresses. So a line of sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3, that line of equal principal stresses would be the same thing as saying it's a line in that space in which you have the same hydrostatic stress throughout any increase in stress. Okay, and so that's what this red line is right here. Now, uh, this kind of plot is useful from this perspective, but in other perspective, perspectives, uh, general multi-axial cyclic non-proportional loading, it's it's not the space that you want to operate in. So it has its use. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, something we need to talk about from the classical perspective of plasticity. But if we can imagine that there's a tube that goes around this, let's see, maybe I can use a different color here. trying to get that to match up. There's a certain level of stress that we do not have yielding that goes around the center line here. But there's a certain value combination of these stress components these principal stress components where we will have yielding. Uh, and that would be represented by this black circle, this black line that goes around this, this line of equal principal stresses. This particular line would have direction cosines, if we want to put a unit normal on it, of 1 over the square root of 3 in each of the uh, directions. So for any stress state, we know we have a set of principal stresses, and we can plot this on these three set of axes. Okay, so I might have a, a stress state that might be uh, here in these three coordinate axes. And we can always have part of this stress state being perpendicular to this normal direction. And we can have some of this that is parallel to this particular direction. And so what we're saying is that the part of this stress state that's parallel to that in direction, that is moving along a direction of hydrostatic stress. We can increase this as much as we want parallel to that in direction, and we're not influencing our yielding of our material. That's the assumption. However, if we move in a direction that is perpendicular to that unit normal, then we are in directions that will influence the yielding of the material. If we are inside the black tube, we're at elastic loading. If we are touching that black tube, we have yielded our material. So if we take a look and look from our perspective and take our, our eyes and look down that in direction, we will see a circle or some other shape but we will see the three axes folded out to create different sectors in this shape. This, we'll call it a circle for now. Okay. 
So what I'm saying is that if we take and look down the n-axis, we will see these three axes that are mutually perpendicular to, it, to each other, but our perspective on it will be that they're 120 degrees apart. So this surface right here is known as the pi plane. Looking down in that direction. Well, this is kind of convenient from our discussion on yield criteria, because as we look down that direction, and if we said that we have an isotropic material, it doesn't matter if this is the sigma 1 axis, or this is the sigma 1 axis, or this is the sigma 1 axis. If we have symmetrical material behavior, behavior along all of those axes will be the same. Additionally, if we have the same material behavior in tension and in compression, if we were to extend this line across here, and this one across here, and this one across here, we would also have the same behavior. Now, this sector is 60 degrees. Okay, again, we're looking at this now as if it's flat. This is not a three-dimensional shape. This is a, a flat shape. And, and those lines that I just drew in are lines of symmetry. Now, what I mean by that is if we were to take a point that was to lay, uh, let's use this dotted line, with a certain combination of principal stresses that caused this point to be here, we would get the exact same behavior of the material as if we are exactly on that side of it. So what that means is we don't really have a 60 degree segment that we need to worry about. What we really have is a 30 degree segment. Let's see if I can draw in another line. So from here to here is 30 degrees. So if we do have a material that meets our criteria, hydrostatic independence, isotropic, same behavior and attention compression, then to explore the shape of our yield criterion, our yield function, we don't have to do all kinds of tests with all kinds of different principal stresses. All we need to do is we need to test within this range of this 30 degree arc uh, or sector in the pi plane. So you can take a testing machine like a tension torsion testing machine and you can apply different values of principal stresses by applying different combinations of tension and torsion and you can investigate the yield surface and get a pretty good uh, uh, result. Again, restricted to those conditions under, under which these assumptions have been made. So this is very interesting. It's whenever you can take your theory and you can use your theory to help you guide your experiment, then you're in, in very good shape. You never want to do an experiment blindly. That only gives you so much information. If you can develop the theory first and then have the theory guide your experiments, uh, then you'll, you're, you're ahead of the game. You're using the most efficient use of your time and your resources to figure something out. Now, if you look at Hill's book or other books,
they do something kind of funny, um, in my opinion. I guess we haven't got to that point yet to know about the convexity of the yield surface, but they will, will show the yield surface to be some sort of uh, uh, weird scalloped shape. So maybe it does something like this. Now, two of the more popular yield criteria for ductile metals is the von Mises and the um, Tresca criterion. Uh, von Mises will plot in the pi plane as a circle, as we have done here, and Tresca plots as a hexagon, either inscribed or circumscribed around the circle. So we can go ahead and make that plot here. So again, this is flat. This is not a three, 3D perspective. This is a flat perspective. And let's uh, see if I can draw a circle. And then the hexagon. If we put in our lines of symmetry, it can be a little bit easier for me. And forgive the, the lack of uh, symmetry due to my drawing. Uh, this would be a symmetric shape. And so this, is, this would be the case if uh, we calibrated our Tresca hexagon based on a uniaxial tensile test result, we could get something different if we were to base the results on our shear result. In that case, the point would be uh, here, halfway in between these two principal axes. All right, so I think that's good enough discussion for this time for taking a look at general functional forms of yield criteria and then looking at the pi plane. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do next is to take a look at uh, octahedral shearing stress and some different relations to uh, and among J2, uh, the octahedral shearing stress, uh, von Mises criterion, and so forth.